Welcome back to Proxam, everybody. And today we're going to be talking about indirect fire. So I had planned to release this before the balanced data slate, but surprise, surprise, it came out on Tuesday instead of Thursday, like I originally thought, and I had to change plans. But I still wanted to talk about this despite the nerfs to several indirect fire units, points wise, that is, nothing changed with the rules, but they did get more expensive. I felt like I still had to talk about this. And that's because indirect fire has often been a huge problem in 40k as far as its ability to be balanced. Either it's super weak and doesn't do a lot of anything, or it's overpowered and everybody's taking it. And in 9th edition, I thought they made kind of a good balance of it near the end of the edition where you basically had minus one to your ballistic skill and, you know, that could stack with minus one to hit in certain cases. And also you were at plus one armor and, you know, this could stack with cover. And this essentially meant that indirect fire could still be good if you combined it with other units, but on its own, it was going to be very weak for the points cost that you were paying for those specific units, which I think is fair because indirect fire units, again, don't need line of sight, which is a huge benefit in the current state of the game. So I wanted to explore that a little bit today because, of course, indirect fire is more powerful, I think, than it was at the end of last edition, even through several nerfs, both points nerfs and in some cases rule nerfs to certain units, it is still a very strong mechanic. So without further ado, let us jump right into it. So we are going to be addressing the following things about indirect fire. We're going to first address the biggest thing, probably for those of you guys who are a little bit newer to the game. What is indirect fire? We're going to be looking at the history of indirect fire in 40k, the many problems with indirect fire in 10th edition specifically, and how to fix it for now and the future. So what is indirect fire? So essentially what it is, is it's a way to ignore line of sight. If a weapon has the indirect fire special rule, you can target any unit within range regardless of whether you can see it or not. However, if you can't see it, you subtract one from your hit roll, and the target has the benefit of cover, which on its face seems like a pretty fair trade, right? Well, you would think so, right? You would think that this is a good trade-off, especially if you look at things like points cost and stuff like that. It would seem that indirect fire is balanced out in the core rules. However, as is often the case, indirect fire weapons are some of the most powerful weapons in the entire game. Regardless of the debuffs that you have with it, the minus one to hit and the benefit of cover, as it just often doesn't matter because these weapons are either extremely powerful or they simply just ignore the modifiers, which I will get into later in this video. So what is the history of indirect fire in 40k? Because it's been a very controversial topic for a while. So in earlier editions, indirect fire was almost always done with blast weapons that scattered. You used a scatter dice and you used either a small or large blast template. And essentially the way it worked is that if you could not see a target, it always scattered the full distance. If you could see it, then you subtracted your ballistic skill from the distance. But either way, a direct hit was, well, a direct hit. You didn't scatter anything unless it had an additional special rule that specified it always scattered. So essentially, weapons like this could have a chance of doing absolutely nothing, scattering off into nothing, or perhaps even hitting your own units. So there was a significant risk there. And of course, if it scattered off the board, it was automatically counted as a miss. So a lot of times units in the back were relatively safe because if it scattered anywhere off the board, it was an automatic miss. So essentially, there was only about a 33% chance that you were going to hit your target as anything else would have scattered at least a couple of inches and back then, typically, if you're going up against an experienced player, they'd have their units spread out a little bit, so you wouldn't get the full effect. And until later 5th edition, when a lot of the indirect fire weapons coming out were becoming stronger, like the introduction of the Imperial Guard Codex and so forth, indirect fire was typically something you didn't see a whole lot of in people's lists. At least in my experience, and of course, you could do a lot to mitigate indirect fire just through, you know, being a good player and being aware and things like that. In later editions, it comprised of a minus one to hit or a ballistic skill modifier, again, like in 9th edition, and gave units a benefit of cover against the attacks, or just an additional armor save, which they did at the end of 9th to kind of curb the power of indirect fire. 
which I do think was a much needed implement in 9th edition as people were running a lot of indirect fire weapons and it was getting out of hand. So then 10th edition comes along and basically you had to start at square one because right off the bat there was a lot of problems with indirect fire. There was things that would just blow units off the table. You had space marine players running massive amounts of desolator marines. You had people running whirlwinds. You had people running basilisks and manticores and all sorts of indirect fire stuff because of the simple fact that the rules for 10th edition indirect fire were much less severe. And on top of this, a lot of point costs for indirect fire weapons were extremely low. Desolator marines could, you know, benefit from a lot of buffs. And on top of that, they were very cheap. And of course, you know, things like Imperial Guard basilisks and manticores were also very cheap as well and could benefit from orders that could essentially ignore the penalties of indirect fire. And basically, a lot of weapons in the game, indirect fire weapons that is, just ignored their own penalties anyway. Right? So either they ignored cover or they simply ignored the ballistic skill modifier because they had the heavy keyword, which gave them plus one to hit when they stood still. And indirect fire weapons in 10th edition, of course, could still benefit from positive hit modifiers as well as rerolls to hit. So these weapons that were supposed to be inaccurate because, you know, they're firing out of line of sight were actually really accurate. They're rerolling your hit rolls, getting plus one to hit, and they really weren't suffering all that much from the penalties of indirect fire. And basically, it became a very uninteractive experience for a lot of armies being basically shut down turn one. And on top of this, you had things like towering. And I know that basically what happened was everybody was talking about how OP Eldar were and how bad the Wraith Knight was and how bad towering was and stuff like that. But indirect fire weapons were also very guilty of being overpowered. They just happened to be slightly less overpowered than some of the other stuff in the game in the beginning of 10th edition like the Wraith Knight, like Imperial Knights, and stuff like that with, you know, that horrible towering rule, which was like indirect fire on steroids. And not only that, but a lot of these indirect fire weapons had powerful abilities that could control the board or just become more accurate, like the Manticore being able to reroll all hits against units five and above. And of course, that's a huge accuracy buff. And then you have control pieces like the Basilisk and the Night Spinner. And of course, the Night Spinner recently did get a nerf, it basically has the same effect as the Basilisk now, but that effect is still pretty good, right? That's still a pretty good effect to have. Minus two to movement, minus two to charge rolls and advance rolls is a powerful control tool. And this is something that we've seen on a lot of indirect fire weapons. So either they're able to ignore their own modifiers or boost their own damage or accuracy, or they're simply able to control the board and maybe they don't need to hit that much to be super effective. And... This just makes them a lot more efficient than what they should really be able to do, even without help. So the biggest example of this, I think, is the Night Spinner, right? The Night Spinner doesn't really need much help, especially before the nerfs, right, to be good. Now, I did plan on putting this video out, obviously, before the nerfs. Now I think the Night Spinner is really expensive, and you might only see one of it in an Eldar army. But essentially, the accuracy of the Night Spinner was really good because you could just throw Guide on it, right? Eldar had the ability to reroll hits with Guide. You had a built-in reroll to hit and to wound with it as well. It was also twin-linked, so you were getting a bunch of rerolls on this thing, and it was really accurate for, you know, being an indirect fire weapon. And then you had other indirect fire weapons in the game that just ignored cover, so maybe some were more accurate, but others just simply ignored the cover bonus that you were getting. So essentially, either way, they were ignoring half of the penalties for being indirect fire weapons and having that massive boost to being able to fire out a line of sight. So essentially, what does this mean? What does it mean to be able to benefit from positive hit modifiers as well as rerolls to hit? Well, it basically means that many indirect fire weapons can be easily buffed safely in their own deployment zone with no risk. These weapons are no risk weapons. You do not have to move them within line of sight. And essentially, opponents are going to have trouble getting to them unless they have specific tools that can deal with them. And those tools are often hard to use. It's based on, you know, if your opponent is screening well enough or if you just have those particular units in your army. And not only are these units low risk, but like I said before, they're very accurate. So they become some of the most accurate and safe units in the entire game. Things like the D-Cannon, which can reroll its own hits because of the attachment ability or just be guided, you know, obviously. Obviously. 
manticores and basilisks being able to take take aim orders and so forth having the heavy keyword as well which is another plus one to hit on top of plus one ballistic skill so these weapons can actually hit very reliably unlike in past editions and again i know this is after the balance data slate and i know some players are going to come after me for this and say well now the manticore is 180 points how could you possibly say that the manticore is not going to be taken in competitive play well it is expensive but you have to understand that the manticore also does not have any real risk of being killed within the first couple turns of the game which means that even though you are spending 180 points on it you are often going to be able to pick off a few units before your opponent can even retaliate, which is a extremely powerful ability to have in your army for sure. Especially in an objective-based game where your opponent may need those units to actually score on objectives and really doesn't have any options turn one if you go first to be able to counter it effectively. And that kind of brings me to my next point. Indirect fire weapons are not interactive and again, many have powerful abilities that also provide board control. They're often hidden out of line of sight, easily screened in the opposite deployment zone, and as such, they are difficult to both hit at range and engage in close combat until later in the game with few exceptions. Super fast armies like Eldar and Dark Eldar can sometimes get to the enemy backfield, but oftentimes won't have the firepower until at least turn two to be able to deal with them effectively. Unless your opponent, of course, makes a huge deployment mistake and doesn't screen out properly. And their abilities are often extremely powerful and affect your units with movement and damage debuffs. So you cannot get to objectives as quickly as you'd want to. And you're starting off on the back foot right away. And this is essentially just a dice roll. So imagine a game being decided by a single roll of the dice. And I know that there's certain missions and stuff like that that give an advantage to one player over the other. But on top of that, if you have a lot of artillery it could spell doom for your opponent before the game has even begun. So whether or not artillery is really OP or not, a lot of people out there are going to say it's overcosted and there's too many points and so forth. That's definitely understandable. You know, GW has reined in artillery quite a bit this edition, but they really haven't changed artillery rules that much. Yes, you can't overwatch with it out of line of sight, which is a decent nerf, but at the same time, it's still pretty strong, it's still very accurate, and can still destroy you turn one if you don't get that first turn. And it can definitely set the pace of the battle in such a way that you're always behind no matter what you do. Especially more expensive and more fragile armies that just really can't take a hit are going to be suffering severely from indirect fire. But even tougher armies can have trouble with this because, like I said before, a lot of these units have abilities that control the board. So tougher units are typically slower to begin with. And if they're moving even slower, they can't get to those objectives and they're going to be behind as well. And they're not going to often have the options or the ability to cross the board quickly to be able to take these things out. So I think indirect fire weapons kind of have to be rethought a little bit. I think they have to be redesigned a little bit. And I just wanted to kind of present this as a little bit of a think piece for you guys out there to start thinking about indirect fire and maybe some of the possible solutions to curbing its insane swingy power because on the other side of the spectrum we do want indirect fire to kind of be in the game still we just want it to be more interactive and more fun for both players right can't be just a totally one-sided event so here's my proposed fix and it may not be perfect but here's what i think could really improve the interaction of indirect fire and also balance it out and as such, you wouldn't have to rely on huge point increases on certain units. You could actually still field these units and feel good about it and not feel like you're you know, spending 200 points on something that is not going to do as much damage as its points cost would suggest. So I think there's a pretty simple fix to this. Essentially, it's this. Unless another unit from your army can draw a line of sight to the target as well in addition, Indirect fire weapons cannot benefit from any positive hit modifiers or re-roll the hit roll. And I really do think this makes sense and makes it a lot more interactive for both players, right? The player with the indirect fire weapons is going to have to use other units in his army or her army to spot enemy units out and be able to fire on them effectively. You can still shoot at enemy units, but 
It's just that those enemy units are going to be harder to hit because obviously you cannot see them. It's going to be a lot harder to actually target these enemy units. So not allowing rerolls to hit or modifiers, you know, positive modifiers to hit on those units that can't draw on a site unless another unit can also see it, I think is a fair trade. And it would definitely prevent a lot of the insane and, quite frankly, silly alpha strikes with artillery armies that would cripple an opponent's ability to even play the game before they get a turn. So I get that some of you out there might be, you know, kind of thinking that this is too much and it's gone too far and proxy hammer, this is ridiculous. Of course, the only reason you're saying this is because you play a super fragile elf army and, you know, you hate indirect fire, but that's actually not really the case. I just think that there should be a little bit more interaction in it. Indirect fire is still going to be very powerful against fragile units. But it just means that if I go second or if my opponent goes second, I'm not going to wreck things in his backfield and then be able to combo off of that indefinitely. I'm not going to be able to use my three night spinners or my indirect fire to kill a unit in the opponent's backfield and then teleport my Uncarn into it so that then I can run into basically his army and destroy it. I'm not going to be able to, as an Imperial Guard player, not only destroy several units in your army that you're going to use to score objectives and things like that, but also be able to slow down the rest so that your army cannot engage with my infantry, who is already happily plotting their way onto objectives that they're going to hold for the rest of the game. Because again, I'm slowing you down and I'm defeating you before you've even engaged me. And what this also does is it encourages the use of scouts and infiltrators to get line of sight on targets early if you want to gain access to accuracy buffs. In other words, using actual tactics to solve problems on the battlefield, right? You have very inaccurate weapons. How do you deal with that? Well, you have spotters that can spot enemy units for you. So you can then shoot them at full power. And this relies on building a list that has actual synergy in it. So I think this is a good idea. I don't think GW is going to actually implement this, however, to be honest. But I think it would be a good fix to a problem that has plagued Warhammer 40k on and off for a long time. So in conclusion, I think indirect fire has been very swingy in the balance department for a long time in 40k and needs to be reworked and rethought a little bit. And trust me, I'm definitely not trying to come after, you know, Imperial Guard artillery commanders and stuff like that who love running artillery and all that. I'm just saying that it doesn't feel good to be on the opposite end of it, especially when that player really hasn't been able to get a first turn. So let me give you a quick example in my experience. Eldar, as you know, have had some of the more powerful indirect fire weapons in 10th edition. And the recently nerfed Night Spinner is a really good example of this. When I was running Night Spinners, if I got first turn, I knew that I was at a huge advantage on both the objective game and on the damage game. Because, of course, I could basically pick at any target I wanted on the battlefield. I could guide a single Night Spinner. I had a rerolls to hit. And full rerolls to wound because of twin linked with devastating wounds. So oftentimes I could just kind of pick my targets as I wanted to or slow down the enemy whatever the situation called for, and it was extremely powerful and extremely uninteractive. And then, of course, I think the greatest example of this was the classic, probably now dead, triple Night Spinner Yinkarn list, right? Being able to basically open up on an enemy army, not only slow it down and control it, but destroy an enemy unit in the backfield, teleport the Yinkarn to it, charge in, and basically have the game over by turn one. And I just think these kind of interactions are a little bit unfair because they don't give an opponent a chance to react, right? So while I definitely think indirect fire should be in the game, it makes absolutely no sense to be as accurate as it is without any real penalties, you know, or without any real synergies or, you know, kind of skill on the player's part. Being able to just blow away enemy units on turn one without any kind of retaliation is something that I think we need to look at as a community and actually have a real honest discussion about. Is this a good way to balance indirect fire? And I personally don't think it is. Obviously, the points costs, I mean, I understand people will use less indirect fire, but I still think that it's not quite balanced properly. 
But of course, let me know in the comments what you guys think about it. I know this wasn't a direct Eldar video. I am working on more videos this week covering the Eldar changes, the nerfs, and also covering quite a few things about the Dark Eldar because, as you guys know, the Dark Eldar just got very scary. And there is some sick combinations in that Dark Eldar detachment that are pure evil. And a lot of Dark Elder players are going to be absolutely thrilled to see it. But I predict the Dark Elder will probably be among the top factions in the entire game once it's all said and done. And once that tournament data starts to come in, I think we will definitely see that. But anyway, more content to come. I will see you guys next time. And thank you so much to all my patrons and supporters who have supported me over the last year. Your support has really helped the channel and helped it grow significantly. If you do want to help support the channel and join my channel's Patreon, I do have free trials activated, which means you get permanent access to our Discord community, which is a community of Eldar players and enthusiasts who love talking about strategy, tactics, and of course, hobbying. I will leave the link for that down in the description. I also have a channel store page and am an Amazon affiliate, so if you want to grab some discounted Eldar miniatures on Amazon or some Eldar apparel on my channel store page to rep your local game store, I will leave those links in the description as well. All right, everybody, that's going to be it for today's video. Thanks for watching. More content to come soon. And man, was that a wild, balanced data slate. I'm still reeling from it, let me tell you. See you guys next time. Have a good one, everybody. Peace out.